back on here and you're set to go again. I missed it. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it too fast. You used to be able to do this just like that. <laughs> <laughs> These, uh, oh, the two square holes. They were put in the box. We built a couple of gadgets and you're supposed to snap these on there and snap it into the box. They used that for a little while, then they gave it up and went back to ties. But again, everything is all plastic, all snapped together, and um, all the flying features. The rudders snapped in. This, by the way, the stabilizer is molded as a part of fuselage. Huh. So uh, this just gets dropped in there and it's ready, and then this gets whipped in here on those pegs and dropped in there. The wing and the front end. So again, the engine is totally trapped. There's a fuel tank built inside here that is a round tank that plugs up on the features built in here. And the fill and drains are built right into it. Now, as I say, this is the original one, and if you look at the bottom, it says tester made in USA. And I'm just looking for something here. Ah, copyright 1976. Okay, been around a while. Now, when uh, Tester folded in 1980, actually 82 is when it all really came down down the pike. They sold out the engine-powered line to uh, Tyco. If you're familiar with the um, the slot cars and tracks and stuff, they make a very fine piece of equipment. I've noticed they're into RC cars now. At any rate. Uh, and they also sold me to Tyco at the same time. So I went to work for an outfit in New Jersey, but luckily they let me stay here to allow Tester to turn these out for them for a while in the plant. This was their decoration scheme. Now this was a hand-painted airplane that we're using to make commercial. Uh, I think they call these a Nighthawk and a Skyhawk or something like that. But. Um, Anyway, again, take advantage of the uh, the way the molds were laid out, and we did a mask. We, we molded them in a dark green and then painted the light stuff. This was then yellow. This was yellow in the mold. These are both came out of the same mold, so we controlled that. So uh, now you notice on the bottom of this one it says Tyco made in Mexico. Now this used to be there. This is all welded up. And uh, in the mold and then redone. Same airplane basically so it went along real well until they tried to set up an engine assembly plant or an engine manufacturing plant in Hong Kong and, and couldn't do it for the price to make it very blunt. Without the boring equipment and the special equipment to make pistons and cylinders you have to realize that what was happening here was that uh, we were building uh, gauges to one and a half tenths. Actually, clearance is between one tenth and, and two and a half tenths between the piston and the cylinder when they're assembled. And this was done by careful control, careful grinding, honing, and then match fitting on a gauge. So each one went out as a set. We did that for 20 cents all together. Anyway, by the time we got to 82, they couldn't. Uh, Tyco couldn't do it for price, so they said, well, okay, we won't do it. So I went out and got other work, and um, lo and behold, Dale Kern called me up and said, we got your um, cosmic wind eyes. We're going to produce it. So I went over it with him and told him what he'd have to do. So he went over, cleaned the moles up. Now you notice that there's, uh, it's now a little Tony. Got all the authentic decals, all the authentic decorations. Got a recognizable Cox engine in it. And what's this one extra screw here is for the uh, the half ounce of nose weight that he had to put in to make it come out right. You see, their engine was an aluminum case compared to our zinc case, and the half ounce of difference was enough to shift the center of gravity to make the airplane fly relatively funny. So they bit the bullet and put in the gadget. Now this airplane probably is uh, may still be available at your um, local discount store or whoever handles Cox equipment. So this airplane, which came out in '76, is uh, the only one of my ready to fly that's still alive. Whew. By the way, this flies 
rather well. The, the whole key with this one now, oh, this is something I forgot to mention. The, the reason we put the wheel pans in was this was a two-stage airplane. We packed a second propeller and the wheel pans and a second set of lines. Now the idea was that once they got to where they bashed it around a little bit and flew this a while, learned how to fly it, then they get bored. So we found that with a, uh, this is a four, four inch, or five inch diameter, two inch pitch prop, 2.38 to be exact, uh, with a, a four, four and a half, this airplane will run 50 miles an hour. So uh, we told the kid, okay, you put the wheel pants on it, you put the longer lines on it, you put this prop on it, go out and fly speed, go race, go do team racing, get a buddy, do you know, all this other good stuff. Whether they did it or not, I never did find out. But that was basically the idea with the whole airplane. And let's see, that pretty well covers the cosmic wind fiasco. <laughs> we'll just shut her off and see what else we can look at. Uh -huh. And this was to, um, uh, back to the, uh, the rack, rack and pinion starter. The, uh, the key was when you back it out. Uh, teeth, standard rack, the gear is in here, and we use the slots in the fuselage to control it. So you push this in, you notice nothing happened because the clutch was working. With everything else right and ready to go, you um, rip this out. This will develop five full turns on the engine, so if it doesn't start on one of those, you probably got something wrong down below. Mm -hmm. And um, worked very nicely. Did they start by hand very easily? Nope. Now, the, the problem with starting with by hand is that uh, the instant reaction from an 049 engine with a prime is after you fire it, it fires back. You get your finger out of the way, it takes off and it runs backwards. Mm hmm. True. The infamous backward running engine. Now, our clutch, as long as you had something attached to it, would prevent that. See, this mechanism here would prevent backward running because it uh, would always wind up against a, a mechanical stop. So uh, our engine, there's no way to make it run backward, and the same same reaction with this. Uh, I I could hand start them, and um, but it's his technique. You just, yeah. You play the game, and you fiddle with it, and you feel it, and you hit it, and it works. If it doesn't work, you say, okay, it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've run across a couple of guys that used to actually uh, make bets they could start an engine on the first clip. And I can't say I admire their intelligence. <laughs> that That's a real gambler. Yeah, that is for sure. But I wouldn't bet the farm on uh, starting any engine on the first flip, no matter how good I felt. Let's see, uh, weird things. Oh, just real quickly, uh, this little experiment was one where I probably learned more about unflapped stunt design than anything. This, this came along about the same time as the, uh, the BD-8. And uh, they wanted... See, Tester, when they saw Cox doing a stuntable airplane to be sold to the general public, mm -hmm. they, um, they asked me to do one, and they were kind of disappointed when I told them I couldn't. Uh, what I had to explain to them was that there's no way in the world to hand we're all beginner in an airplane that's capable of doing a pattern. Or even capable of doing a loop, to be honest about it, because you're going to stick it in the ground and break it. True. So uh, I don't know whether we explained our philosophy of the, of the fly on on tape or not. You'd mentioned that you'd seen the kid that uh, was flying this thing just as smooth as a rock and uh, went out and grabbed a normal trainer and stuffed it. Well, the key to this one was the fact that we set the airplane up to where the kid had control of it, but he didn't have any control much. He could make it go up a little bit, he could make it go down a little bit, but he couldn't do anything dangerous. Now, the biggest problem we had was if the wind was really blowing hard, he would eventually get into an up-down oscillation, which would skip it off the deck. But the key to it was that he would, he could go out, he could get the engine to start by himself, he could get the airplane off the ground by himself, and he could get it back on the ground by himself without breaking it. And this is what we really worked our little rear end off to achieve. 
See, you notice that the modelers, the, the U-Control modeler, has always loved Cox because of the PT-19. But I doubt if anybody ever saw a kid pick up a PT-19 by himself and fly it. There's no way he's going to make it. But I did the same thing. I had the same problem because I was a U-Controller and by golly, I wasn't going to let anybody do this because it was hard. It's not hard. But the, uh, the thing that made the PT-19 popular was that you go out there and you would get the engine started up, you get the kid on the handle and you run out there and you grab his hand and you fly him in the airplane and everybody is having a lot of fun. But if you let go of it, he's going to stick it. But uh, from there on, it, it is kind of all downhill. So um, what we did uh, when we got into our demo phase, we finally, when we got the fly-ins, we were able to, we'd show off the rest of the stuff. And we had kids doing all the flying. They were my sons and John Barr's son and some other people. But uh, we would do all of our flying and we'd do all the whiz-bang stuff. And then we would open the circle up and get, line up half a dozen kids and fire up a P-40, put the kid on the handle and he'd stay with him so he didn't wander out of the circle, tell him this is up, that's down. And let go. He was on his own. And 60 to 70 percent of the time he would fly the airplane long enough till he either got so dizzy he couldn't stay with it, in which case uh, we'd grab it from him, or he'd make the whole flight. Or he'd stick it. If he sticked it, or sticked, excuse me folks, if he did stick it, it would bounce. And we'd just go back and uh, put the, find the spinner, put the spinner back on, fire it up and give it to him again. So with a demo like that, you can demonstrate the, um, the toughness of the airplane and all these other features. But it was a long time, I'm not even certain, I think maybe Cox's uh, series of airplanes about this size they might have been able to turn the kid loose. I really, I didn't follow it, the, the demos too much after that. But to get back to this machine here, this was in the phase where I determined that you really got to have high aspect ratio, and I said, okay, eight to one is it. Originally, this stabilizer was had this kind of span on it. It was uh, 13 to one. But this little beast. This has got more hours in the air on it than uh, everything except the uh, carrier thing we were looking at. It's been flown on lines from 22 feet to 42 feet. It's been stuck in the ground. It's uh, been vibrated around a little bit. You know, there's some strange patterns here. But uh, almost wore the wheel off. You can tell by the shape of the skid, that used to be a point. See that. So, uh, but we learned a lot off of this particular machine. It, um, like I say, it would do a full pattern, including vertical apes on 22 foot lines. And you want to be moving fast, that's moving quick. But it would actually do, you could uh, turn it in under the 90, Huh. Do your vertical eight, do the hourglasses. Never dared bring it out and show it to anybody as a, like a judge because I'm sure they would have gone bananas after the third maneuver because it was all over with in about uh, <coughs> two minutes. <laughs> what normally takes guys five minutes to do, we were doing it in uh, something less than two <laughs> with a level lap in between. So, And you notice also that we have a very exotic piece of equipment up front. A, an old standard McCoy 049 with a um, globy head and reduced compression. But um, this thing also, by the way, had a, originally had a high aspect ratio fin until I found out what high aspect ratio fins do for you, particularly with this long wing. I believe I'm describing the, uh, you're flying along straight and level and you get off on the, about 45 degrees off of the downwind side and the airplane go yahoo. That's hmm. what was doing it. I put this fin on it that stopped. Just like that. One day in, one day out. So what was happening is uh, there, there's a series of equations which define the motion. But what really ends up happening is this tail is the airplane is not yawing but it's flying in a yawing wind. 
So it's the airplane's yawing, but it can't move because of the force range between the readout guide and the CG. That's much more powerful than this other one. But there's enough force here if the fin is big enough and far enough back, a bit moment arm, that this surface will develop a maximum lift condition and then stall sharply. When it stalls, the airplane pops. And when you pop in yaw, you develop a little pitch motion. And that one is a little uh, a little harder to describe where it comes from, but it's there. So if the guys are, your stunner is uh, dropping the wing on after you pass through the, the dead downwind position, in other words, the wind is blowing right down the tail of the airplane, about in here, in other words, about 45 degrees from that point, it'll do a hoop de doo If it's doing that, just start playing with your fin area until it stops. Or get rid of your swept wing. One of the two. Okay, I'm going to shut this thing down just a minute. Good. Look at five. <coughs> Which, oddly enough, turned out to be a 33 by the time they got the bore and stroke figured out. But uh, it's all frozen up from castor oil. But um, the engine you're looking at here right now is uh, complete with all the parts and there's nothing broken on it. The, uh, the second one actually looks more like an engine because it's, well, they got the needle, oh, that's right, the needle valve wouldn't fit into the, uh, the box. That's why this punched out place is another industrial accident. But I don't know, can, uh, can you see this is a, that's a needle valve, by the way. That is a needle valve? Yep. The only oh thing that makes it look different is the fact that the, uh, it's a big diameter with a taper on it, whereas a, the one you're used to is a small diameter with a taper on it, so. Mm-hmm. But this just happens to uh, what they've done. The coverage is kind of hard to see what's happening here. I don't know whether you can get in close enough or not. But the fuel was fed in, and it actually contacted down in this area. And then this taper, the fuel had to go around this part and out the hole on the far side. Hmm. Oddly enough, it worked. But uh, this is the, uh, the fuel intake here. Had to go in, in, and then back, and then into the venturi. Oddly enough, this strange-looking. Um, oh, it works. Okay. This gadget here now is a throttle with a second needle valve, which drifts across, and as the as you close this off, you can then eventually adjust the idle mixture. And this was their idea for controlling the stroke. It actually worked uh, relatively well, except that the engine had a cooling situation where if you idled it too long, it would cool down and it wouldn't come back up. As soon as you popped it, it would uh, die. But um, it's a very interesting engine. It's got, um, unfortunately, you really can't look down inside, but it's got all those strange features. It's an aluminum crankshaft, and there's an aluminum crankshaft inside that this is cranked onto. You know, this is a set screw setup. And then the connecting rod is a rather strange looking piece that it fits into the crankshaft at an angle and goes across and there's a ball socket in the back and then there's another arm that follows down and, and connects into here. So when you rotate the crank, it rotates this and this transfer of motion makes this end go this way. Worse yet, it's it's rocking in this direction. That thing has got more motions to it than uh, Carter's gave pills in the old days. But uh, I'm not certain how many of these things were actually made. So, um, and there won't be any more because the guys uh, put well. There was a flaw in the uh, connecting rod, which guaranteed the connecting rod was going to break. So every engine that was made, is it was run long enough, it would bust. Hmm. Build in, uh, and as I understand it, there wasn't enough money in the company, I think, Aero Research and Development, um, to recover. They couldn't get more more Conrad's made, so the whole thing just kind of went down the drain. Hmm. The engine ran very well. It ran just as well as the Stunt 35. Would do everything a Stunt 35 would do, and of course it had the advantage of being fitted into the, you know, it's a neat shape. Mm-hmm. 
And this was as big as your fuselage had to be. The fact is, well, you remember I pointed out that uh, big splinter over there with a six foot wing on it? Mm hmm. That's the picture. Uh, this is the one that was driving it originally. That's why that front end looks like that. Fortunately, when the engine broke, I didn't want to break the second engine, so I rebuilt the front end. And when I rebuilt the front end, I had to slice the spar, and when I finally got the airplane working very well, it broke. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll tell you what, let's just make somebody's mouth water. Core 60. This is a... Um, I understand from looking at the collector's magazine of uh, the MECA group. Oops. Oh, that fit better than that. Alright, so I don't want to be that way about it. At any rate, there's a genuine Virgin McCoy 60 Series 20. One of 5,000 which were built. Sandcast? Yep. Yeah, well, all these were sand castings. See, this was right after they discovered the glow. They they took out the slot, took off the ignition timing. But this was the hot setup uh, in the around I think 1955, if I'm not, not mistaken. Mm-hmm. But um, this pr little particular piece of equipment's got all the uh, the box. For some reason, didn't want to come out of the other carton. I'm going to leave it in there. But uh, original plug, original head, I think it's been, well, I know it's been run because they ran every one of them. Matter of fact, Charlie Miller himself took each engine out in the vent and ran it in the run-in room. So, it's the kind of guy he was. Pieces are here, and uh, there's a, if you like history, hey, they moved. Oh. Tester Corporation 520 Buckby Street, so that's not their address anymore. But I love this two cent stamp. Yeah. Yep, that is old. That'll tell you what happened. I keep reading about a guy named Dick McCoy. Does he have anything to do with this, or he just. Oh, yeah. This was his de engine design. Yeah, Dick developed it. Um, he kept it going, he raced it. He's still going, by the way. He still makes uh, some of the finest custom engines in the world. Oh. Uh, I'm trying to remember where I read it. Uh, read his name. I think it car racing, probably. Yeah. Matter of fact. Yeah, there are some McCoy car engines. Yeah, he's still. Um, he's a sharpie. Ex he's one of the best machinists around. His son, or two sons, I believe, have gotten in his business. They have a, a specialty business where um, they do all the hard machining work that uh, nobody else can do. It's like a story Duke Fox told. Uh, he, back in the days when he was looking around for something else to make the money on, he, oh, he took a government contract to um, manufacture a part, which was pretty much a little 049 piston and cylinder set. Mm -hmm. It was a, a lapping and honing job, which uh, for him was trivial. Uh, the trouble is, when he told them the price that he would have to charge them for that particular thing, they said, we're not even going to talk to you. Nobody can do it that cheap. And oh. they stuck by it. He didn't get the job. He could have made the whole piece for them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I think part of one of the things that the modelers got to realize is that any one of these engines is the result of some very fine, very sharp machinist and some people knowing how to set up machine tools and work metal and do the metallurgy and all the things to make them work. Engine design is almost all experimental. I know I started uh, digging around for the equations and they don't tell you that much. No. The difference between a good engine and a bad engine is beyond the mathematics. Mm -hmm. This looks, it's got a gold case. Oh, it's there it is. That's that strange one I was talking to you about. My uh, oldest son. Now, 
that uh, Cox, when they got into the 15, they went through um, literally 20 or 25 basic designs in a very short period of time. Now what you see here is one version. Do you notice that the, this engine has got a problem because when they cut, there's a clearance groove cut in the crankcase. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know whether you can see this thing, but one side of that has been uh, hit pretty hard. I think probably dragged the Conrad around there. And there? We're here. My wife has arrived in her car. So better shut it down and we'll... Okay. Well, we'll <laughs> call this off then. Temporarily. <laughs> okay. I'm going to shut him down. Okay. Yeah, it appears to be I'm getting... Okay. That should be it right there. Okay, it's kind of cupped. Yeah, that... I think we've got it. That... Okay, well, well, what you're looking at right now is actually the same size as the Ringmaster, it's a 360 square inch wing. Mm -hmm. And out on the front of that long red stick, there's a TD-049. And that big yellow thing on the back is what makes it go up and down at a great rate. So, and it also keeps it from going up and down when you don't want it to. So I think if we uh, adjourn to the garage, I can show you the drawings and we go from there. All right. All right. Yeah, because there's nothing on there that doesn't do something. And besides, they already had a bear cat. So. <laughs> Did you ever publish this in a magazine? Nope. No, the only time this airplane uh, got into uh, competition was at the Nationals when Bob took it to, I forget which meet now, but uh, by the time he was all done flying it, they gave him a second. So we quit. We said, to heck with it. <laughs> huh. It's dead. This was in a national. This airplane flew in a nationals. Yeah, in the 049. Oh, okay. Uh, half A event they call it. But uh, for some reason or other, it it wasn't his day, or his time. So, but um, yeah, we can show you. We give you a rundown on all the equipment it takes to make this little thing work. All right, let's in, shut off and go to the garage. In a minute. Okay, and this is called the Bearcat. Right. Oh, I'll get the corner up here. Okay, this one is, um, this is 40 square inches bigger than the one that we got in the pictures. And what we've done with it, we've gone back. I've realized something that uh, every time I come up with a new airplane, I build it with geodetic structure. Mm-hmm. And they work great, and they're strong, and they do all this neat stuff. And then when I say, well, I'm going to have to give it to the people, they don't want that stuff. So I go back to the normal rib patterns. To heck with it. I'm going <laughs> to leave the geodetic structure this time. Because uh, what we're doing here, we've got the, the front quarter of the wing is lumber, which is a good part of the wing, by the way. By the way, this part of the wing lifts half, and this part of the wing lifts the other half. Mm -hmm. So, and then there's just enough structure through here to uh, support the monocoat a little bit. But uh, this should be relatively stiff. Uh, we go back to old free fly structure here. You build yourself a little form for the inside of this right. rib. Right. Got the laminated tip bow. Just laminate them. It's like an old Piper Cub or something. Sure. And then everything else is built, uh, we build it up. Now I don't know whether people are really going to want to build this tube front end or whether they just go back and build a square one like we normally do. But there is a method here of wrapping a um, 30 second spiral sheet in three layers and building a front end that doesn't weigh anything. Mm -hmm. And if we stick with the board. Landing gear then is a um, the plug-in type arrangement. Because what I found here is if you're going to fly this thing out of grass, you want to put the wheel up here. So maybe fly it off the hard top, you want the wheel back here. So mm -hmm. two different positions. The fun part, which takes it out of the kiddies area, is the um, stabilator construction, I think. But in order to make it work, I'm pretty sure we need this type of thing. Now, the, the original Bearcat had a flat stabilator, but it was didn't have the stiffness. There were times when we thought we could see flex or feel flex. Mm -hmm. So 
So what we got here is a, a monoboom type arrangement and a reasonably good hinge and a, and a ballot surface. Now there's, um, I don't know whether this sketch is good enough to show you the other half of the secret. But planted right in this area is a differential bell crank. I'll have to get you a better sketch. Oh wait, I know where one is. If you oh, want to shut okay. her down a sec. Sure. The prints of this, as a matter of fact, I've got to finish them. There's a couple of more details. but Essentially what happens here is there's a pin in th this crank, which is pivoted and attached to the controls. This is attached to your uh, flying system. And the slot is in your main bell crank. Now what happens is when you move, essentially what's happening is the arm starts off uh, with a with its longest position here and it moves very slowly and it starts speeding up mm -hmm. toward the end. So what happens is you can move, uh, make little minor movements uh, accurately when you're trying to fly level, which it, we found out that you do have to fly level, the airplane won't. And something, uh, matter of fact, we challenge the guys to do on a day that's not too windy get the airplane up, get it grooved uh, at about, say, 10 or 15 feet, and then reach out in front and pinch the lines together and lock them mm -hmm. very carefully, and then see what happens. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, matter of, in other words, after you get it grooved here, and just reach up and pinch the old lines together and lock them up. This locks the elevator, and then watch what happens to the airplane. Hmm. You will, uh, basically what will happen, you start seeing a minor oscillation get bigger and bigger. And I'll be darned. All you have to do, if you don't move your hand, then just pop it. The airplane will stop itself right away. So, is that due to the large uh, tail? Oh no, it'll happen with any airplane. Oh, I've never tried it on any airplane. Doesn't make any difference what airplane you got. It'll uh, it'll do it. That's why we we finally realized that what really is happening is when the airplane is flying in the groove on a windy day, the pilot is fixing it. Now, the better he fixes it, the better the airplane looks. But if you're with a flapped airplane, part of what happens is when you make a move, you, you see what's happening. You may not think it's going up, I want to go down. You just correct it. Mm -hmm. With a flapped airplane, it overcorrects. You correct it, it pops, and then it drops, and you're, you get behind it. That's why they tell you to drill that enormous hole in your elevator report. That's where the slop comes the slop. from. Yep, it works. But it creates other problems. These are not that interesting um, and without half hours worth of explanation. <laughs> there are the movement charts for that system. Uh, let's see. The other thing that's interesting is these are all of the, um, this is what I've been into lately, is cranking out paper. Mm -hmm. These are all of the numbers that are important to um, make an airplane work. What I've done, I've set up my uh, computer now to, you plug in a, a wingspan, root cord, tip cord, uh, a couple of other pieces of data that tell you what shape the wing is. And while you're doing that, these are all being calculated automatically. Mm -hmm. And these are, some of these equations are, are worth about 10 to 15 minutes with a calculator punching numbers. So this is why I got a little bit of cavalier. Same thing with the stab. And then these equations down here take the wing and the stab and relate them to give me um, this particular little number here, the slope of the um, pitch, pitching moment about the CG is the important one. This number tells you what the, the slope of the curve is, which tells you what the airplane's reaction is to after being displaced. Mm -hmm. The larger, the, this isn't very big, but uh, the O2 is um, extremely powerful. Uh, combat airplanes, the way the guys are flying them now, I find most of them are down to 004, 003, 002. Which essentially means they've got uh, less than half or, or less than a tenth of the, the stability. Which is fine for them because all they're trying to do is, is either do a loop or not do a loop. Well, that's basically and, it. And uh, they're perfectly happy with it. And it, it's the type of thing you get with a huge wing, a relatively short tail moment arm, and then a real minimal type of stabilizer. Yep. 
and it's absolutely perfect for what they want to do because they want to turn without slowing down so when you got a huge tail it develops drag so you don't want to move it as much up and down then no the other limiting factor and it's hard to describe um, this has to move but the instant you develop a loop so well maybe I can uh, I've made some drawings but I don't know exactly where they are now so why don't we just work let me grab something heavy and uh, there must be something heavy around here someplace that will show us But what sort of happens is when you develop a, uh, a loop, oh, that's not gonna help. all these things are cold. <laughs> oh, I know where they are. Oh, let me get out of your way. Yeah, excuse me. Sure. This is probably a little better, to, more like a blackboard type. Okay. But if we develop a, in other words, if we make this the path of an airplane in a loop, and then we come along and we say, okay, the airplane is, uh, the center of the tail is here and the center of the wing is here. And then we try to draw an airplane going around this path. Now the wing has to be at an angle of attack at this point, so it, it's going to look like something like this. Now suddenly if we exaggerate this airplane, the real tail is out here. Mm -hmm. So you've got, if you've got a a stabilator, you got a pretty good situation. But you notice that the air is now approaching that stabilator at almost a zero angle. This is an exaggeration. There's downwash and some other things that happen that make this uh, change around. But what's really happening is that the, the tighter your loop and the longer your moment arm, the more physical travel you have to have here just to keep the thing from losing. Right. So what we do here is uh, we minimize this dimension while we, which forces us to maximize the stabilizer. And by the time you're all done playing the games, as long as I have, you end up this set of parts is about as good as you're going to get. If I deviate from any of these, the airplane sort of uh, you get a performance curve looks like this. If I deviate from any of these, they go go off one side of this. I either get too stable or too unstable. Mm -hmm. uh, we start losing losing ground if this were a graph of performance. So, um, and you notice too that the uh, the side view of this is very minimal. I notice that your uh, your vertical fin you've got the same thing top and bottom. Yeah, that develops. Uh, we determined something else that the ideal airplane has thrust, wing drag center, and stabilizer drag center all on the same line. Uh, people will tell you a lot of things, but um, and with a flapped airplane, you can this can get you in some trouble due to the downwash off of the flap. So they put the elevator up or down or some other. And then this arrangement here is the one that makes the airplane more prone to turning outside than inside. Now if you lower this, which is wrong because your lift landing gear gets long, mm -hmm. now it makes the airplane turn tighter. So you go thrust, your thrust line drops below this, and you have a turning moment already built in that you right. have to counter with this. But you'd end up with this airplane, if I put the uh, thrust line, say, up here and exaggerate it, when I flew the airplane, I would be riding uh, an up, amount of up here to counteract that, just to hold it level. Mm -hmm. Then when I get ready to do an outside, I release that. This thing goes, wow. But try to go the other way. Now you're fighting this, and the airplane is groaning and you know going around slowly. And you go this way. And you come back and you do one of the, you go that way. Not a pretty picture. Ooh. So, um, 
That's why we end up building these things. With everything on the same line. I hate the landing gear because I'm tempted to put another one up there, but it would look so bad that I don't. But symmetry really is a, um, it's almost biblical, if you will. So um, that's what that's all about. But the, uh, let's see. That, basically, that's what this little machine is all about. The, the key is to get 400 square inches weighing something less than, uh, well, if you blow it 14 ounces dry, you're in pretty good shape. That will, uh, the numbers indicate that you can pretty well pour that through a, uh, let's see, what about this sign uh, here? Maybe it's about a pickup. Let's mix a set of data. And we could never do that and put a 35 on it, I don't think. No, immediately, the 35 loses you in several directions, uh, one of which is. So you've got to carry, in other words, you've got a six ounce engine instead of a, uh, an ounce and a half. You've got uh, four to five ounces of fuel instead of uh, an ounce and a half or two ounces. Mm, that's true. Uh, well, you've got to put the fuel in the nose, so you've lost the advantage of having this. Mm -hmm. See, the other key to this one, by the way, is that the fuel is stored on the center of gravity in a little bladder tank. Right. And that, this works great. We've We've flown this enough, there's absolutely no problem with it. Once you do a couple of three things correctly, one we found that you need to put a filter right here as a little reservoir. Mm -hmm. and that also enables you to handle the engine while you're starting it. And then uh, actually there's a, a brake, the line comes out where you can get out of here and load the tank. Uh, drops inside the fuselage, runs down, and then just pops out right here to the filter and then you feed it to the engine. That, uh, that system is almost flawless. Except when you fall and out your braking, you go tank every now and then, and you don't get all the parts out, you suddenly find out that your tank will only... When you fill your tank the same amount, it's bucked up against a bunch of junk. Yeah. And went to a false pressure. So you get it all set, and uh, takes off, and runs about five laps, and goes dead lean. Mm-hmm. Oh, bad boys have the same problem with theirs. Oh, you bet. So you got to be meekness counts to a great extent. So it's sort of a cross between a, a good combat ship mechanically and um, construction. 